Hello and welcome to the JCC of Metro Detroit 69th Annual Detroit Jewish Book Fair. My name is Gail Hines and I'm on the Book Fair Committee. It is my pleasure to welcome you on this Friday afternoon to hear Jonathan Reed Kaufman, author of The Last Kings of Shanghai, The Rival Jewish Dynasties That Helped Create Modern China, presented in partnership with the 2020 uh, Ann Arbor Jewish Book Festival. The goal of the Detroit Jewish Book Fair is to bring the best new Jewish books and author from around the world to Metro Detroit. This year, the rooms we are sitting in may be different, but that purpose remains. The book fair runs until December 9th, and we have an exceptional lineup of events planned. To see the full schedule, learn about ways you can support book fair, watch events you may have missed, and find our online store where you can find The Last Kings of Shanghai and plenty of other hand-selected books and gifts, visit our website at culturalarts.jccdet.org slash bookfair. This year, in order to provide as much programming to the community as possible, we've made all of our events free of charge. So if you enjoy this event and other book fair events, please consider becoming a patron or donating to book fair. You can do either or both at our website, culturalarts.jccdet.org slash book fair. We rely on community support to make this annual event possible. So thank you in advance for becoming part of our family. The Book Fair team would like to thank the following sponsors for their support. Day sponsor, Carol and Ronald Fogel. Sponsor, Nancy and Sam Shamey and Family and the Khan Haddock Center for Judaic Studies. The co-sponsors, myself, Gail Hines, and Bluma and Robert of Blessed Memory Schechter. We have a really special event for you this afternoon. And after, and we want you to be part of it. You can ask questions and offer comments in our YouTube comments section below or by texting the number in the corner of your screen. Our speakers have a great discussion planned and they will take as many questions as they can. While you're here at our YouTube channel, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the reminder bell. That way, you'll never miss any of our exciting events. Now, please join with me in welcoming Professor Howard Lupovich of the Khan Haddock Center for Judaic Studies, who will introduce our speakers. Hello, everybody. Uh, I, hope, I hope everyone can hear me. Please forgive my voice is a little uh, raspy and worn out today. I think maybe through too much use, but it's still a pleasure to be part of this program on behalf of the Cone Haddock Center. It's always a pleasure to work together with Book Fair. I think. Uh, if, if, if in case we in case we forget or lest we forget, we shouldn't take for granted that Book Fair really is one of the dual programs in our community, and it's really a pleasure for the Cone Hat Up Center and myself to be a part of it each year. We look forward, and every year we're never disappointed by the quality and the range of, of knowledge that's presented at the Book Fair. So uh, this this year, it's my it's my privilege and my pleasure to introduce. Jonathan Kaufman. Uh, Jonathan Kaufman is a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and journalist. He's currently the director of the School of Journalism at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, he has written on, uh, as, as, as often is the case with journalists, he's written on a broad variety of subjects, books, essays of, 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 of varied lengths. He, uh, he has that standard journalistic ability to have real range and expertise on a whole, on, on, so, on so many topics. I have to say, you know, someone who's someone who's uh, more inclined toward academic specialization, we're always a little envious of journalists who can comment so, so uh, you know, so insightfully on so many different things. 
he's going to speak today about his about his latest project the last kings of shanghai and b- before i l- let him let him explain this i i just want to I, I what i really want to get across to you is when we think of jews in china we oftentimes think of it as really in terms of two kind of exotic stories there's that there's the Jewish community of medieval Kaifang. Uh, that's one story. And there's the, and there's Shanghai, which was a refuge for Jews fleeing the Holocaust in the, during the 1940s and the 30s and 40s. But the, uh, the story of Jews in China and their connection is much bigger than simply some exotic, out-of-the-way story. This story really illustrates um, the story he's telling about, about the, these two families, these two Sephardic families, the Sassoon and the Kaduri families really illustrates the fact that uh, geographically there really was no limit to where Jews, where they engaged, where they had influence. They Jews Jews spread their wings in all directions, and it's a story that uh, I mean, it's a, it's a story of a family that whose just whose life and whose adventure, whose trajectory spans all the way from China all the way to the Middle East. Uh, it, it's a vital story of what Jews were able to accomplish or what Jewish families are able to accomplish when they really, when they can work together and put their minds to it. it it's a, it, it really is a remarkable story. And uh, I hope you'll join with me in welcoming Jonathan Kaufman to speak about his new book. Thank you, Howard, for that introduction. And um, uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for being here to share with us your most recent work. I I just need to thank you from a personal level as well. Uh, This work means a lot to me. I um, I actually took a trip with my family in October of 2018, and it was on an adventure to to discover China. I'm glad I went because I think that trip is more complicated in 2020 than it was back then. Um, but you know, a telltale personal experience was that we hired a private driver to take us out to um, a, a local area to Beijing where we could see the Great Wall. And um, you know, thinking about as I read the interpreters that came along with a lot of your subjects in the early days of establishing themselves in China, I had my 10 cent application on my phone and I started talking to the driver and I wanted to share with him so much that um, that my grandfather was saved by being able to escape from uh, Germany. He lived in Bavaria and was born there. First time leaving was on his way to Shanghai um, on a ship through the Suez Canal, as you've described. So many took that journey, and uh, he spent 20 months between uh, 1939 and uh, 1941 in in Shanghai. And uh, with this app out and talking to this Chinese cab driver, I I wanted him to know this story, too, from my perspective. And um, and when he responded, I was shocked that this was a story he actually knew. And he looked at me very proudly and smiled and he said, we Chinese, we are heroes. We saved Jews. Hmm. Some some 18,000 refugees made it through Shanghai. Um, and I actually, you know, just because I'm sharing my family album and being selfish with your time for a moment before uh, I, I have you have a go, um, I think I've got a picture here of my grandfather, if I can get there, figure out the technology. Is it going to work? Here we go. Um, and uh, this, um, I, I learned through your work, is actually his exit visa uh, because Jews fleeing from Nazi Germany um, and Adolf Hitler uh, needed exit visas to be able to make their way, but um, but thanks to the uh, real work and and funding and organization, uh, not only of Chinese officials who saw the need of preserving human life, but uh, these two significant Jewish families that that had their roots in Shanghai, my grandfather was saved. And so, indeed, not only were the Chinese heroes in saving my family, but I also think these dynasties, the, the Kaduris and the Sassoons. Um, and uh, and so I, I, I'm just so thrilled and excited to hear from your perspective and your words. Uh, c- can you introduce us to these two dynasties and tell us a little bit about who they are and how they made their way? Sure. Um, I mean, by the time your grandfather had made his way to Shanghai, the Sassoons and the Kaduris had actually been in Shanghai for more than 100 years. 
Um, they had started out in um, uh, in Baghdad. And of course, as Jews, when we talk about Jewish history, we all know the story of Fiddler on the Roof. And many of our families who came from Russia or Germany um, lived in ghettos or poor neighborhoods or here in America and kind of worked their way up to kinds of achievement and, and so forth. But the Sassoons and the Kaduris were different. The Sassoons especially were almost royalty in Baghdad. Um, they had been taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar um, way back uh, during the destruction of the temple. Um, and there's that famous line in the Bible that by the rivers of Babylon, we wept when we remembered Zion. Babylon is Baghdad. But in fact, families um, that were taken there captive soon adjusted very well and um, were very successful economically. They also created a flourishing uh, Jewish uh, diaspora in terms of scholarship. And they were so prominent that the rulers of Baghdad, whether they were Persians or Ottomans or, or Turks, would often turn to the leading members of these families for advice on economic issues, foreign policy issues. And so the Sassoons were this leading family. They were literally given a title, which was Prince of the Jews. And whenever the head of the Sassoon family uh, went to meet the ruler of Baghdad, he was carried on a sedan chair. And everyone uh, in the street, Jew and non-Jew alike, would bow their heads respectfully when he passed. This was the kind of authority they had. Now, as we know, things often turn bad for Jews in, in many countries, and eventually the Sassoons had to flee Baghdad. Um, David Sassoon, the patriarch, um, was imprisoned and was uh, being held for ransom. And so his father ransomed him out, took him down to the waterfront, put him on a boat, wrapped him in a cloak that had pearls sewn inside it, and set him off to kind of find safety outside of Baghdad. And he ended up in India. Um, right at the time when the British Empire was expanding. And um, he eventually got the rest of his family out. And because the Sassoons had this incredible economic and business experience, he begins to rebuild the family fortune in India. And he does it actually through opium. Um, the opium was legal at the time. Um, the British taxed it. And it's a part of Jewish history that maybe we're not as familiar with, but it was the foundation um, of, the, of the Sassoon fortune. And as the British Empire expanded, David Sassoon saw opportunities in China, um, probably the last place you would think of going. Um, but he had eight sons, and he deployed these sons uh, to go to China uh, to see if he could expand his business. And Shanghai was the city that became kind of the central city for them. And um, they did extremely well there. Um, the Chinese, after the communists took over in 1949, the Chinese uh, seized all the business records of the Sassoons, which I was able to see. And they concluded that the Sassoon family had probably made more than a billion dollars um, in terms of their trading activities in China uh, during the, the hundred years that they spent there. So they were an extraordinarily wealthy and influential family, um, but also they had a lot of fun. And um, at the time your grandfather uh, arrived and these refugees were arriving in the 30s, the head of the family was a man named Victor Sassoon. And he built a hotel, the Cafe Hotel, which was the grandest hotel in Asia. He had these extraordinary parties where he would make people dress up as um, as circus performers and he would be the ringmaster or as school children and he would be the principal. Charlie Chaplin would sail across to go to these parties. Uh, Noel Coward wrote Private Lives at this hotel in Shanghai. Wallace Simpson, who ends up uh, marrying the King of England and making him leave his throne, was photographed only wearing um, a life jacket. So it gives you a sense for a kind of the sort of wealth of these families, but also the kind of social status and the kind of fun that they had um, during the 30s. Right. I, I know my grandfather actually went and applied for a job at the Cafe the Peace Hotel, uh, as it's, it's known today. And um, I guess in the words of a, a more contemporary Sassoon character, let bygones be bygones, that he wasn't given the job. But <laughs> nevertheless, you know. Um, yeah. 
it's something that you haven't shared and something that's really interesting. You're talking about this globalist family is is the way that they viewed Great Britain and you know the way of fleeing the Turks, leaving from Baghdad and and then really wanting to find a way in the world. I mean, they were in pursuance of night ships and, and whining and dining with uh, royalty. Um, can you share a little bit of that part of it? Yeah, you know, again, we, we tend to think of, of Jews, especially in Europe and in the United States, as outsiders. And the Sassoon certainly were, but I think they realized that in the 1840s and 1850s, when they left Baghdad, that Britain was the future. London was the most important city in the world. It was the hub of global commerce. And they also understood that, you know, to be successful in business, you also had to have connections, you had to have success, uh, success in government. And so um, David Sassoon, with his eight sons, um, basically uh, taught them English. Um, and he made sure they knew British history. Uh, they all became British citizens. He actually named one of his sons after uh, Prince uh, Prince Albert, um, who was um, who was married to Queen Victoria. They were very much trying to ingratiate themselves um, with the British aristocracy. And as the, the sons begin to move to London, they buy great estates, they send their children to Eton and to Oxford. Um, and it's interesting when I, I was able to see a lot of the family records and, you know, the, the Sassoon patriarchs are nervous about all this. And in their wills, they're writing, you know, you still must marry someone from Baghdad. You still must marry someone Jewish. Um, but of course, many of them did intermarry. Um, and, um, and there were just incredible opportunities for them. Um, but there was also a certain amount of anti-Semitism. I think the British enjoyed doing uh, business with the Sassoons, um, and they certainly welcomed them to Buckingham Palace, and Winston Churchill um, hosted them, and they certainly operated at the very highest levels of British society. But in private, often literally when they left these parties, they would write in their diaries, which I was able to see, comments about the hook-nosed Jews and the Jew boys. The, the, the social um, anti-Semitism was, was still there. So it was a relationship in a sense, both sides got what they wanted. Um, but the Sassoons, I think, were always kept at a distance, even though they were given all the knighthoods and, and, and so forth. Hmm. So there's there's another prominent family and, and something that, you know, I suspect they're actually, they're cousins, is that correct? The Kaduris and the Sassoons? Yeah, they're distant cousins. So the Sassoons had left Baghdad and they'd begun to establish their business empire in India and in China. And as it grew, they needed more and more people to staff their offices, people they could trust, people they could rely on. Because remember, this is in the 19th century. It's not like you could pick up the phone and call people. They were sending people out for months at a time and, and had to trust that they would run the business well. So what they did was they went back to Baghdad and they said, if you'll send your teenage sons, they were you know, often almost always sons, uh, to work for our company, uh, send them as teenagers, uh, we'll educate them, um, we'll train them, we'll give them a job. Um, we've built synagogues in China where we, they'll be guaranteed to have a place where they can get religious training. If they get sick, they built a Jewish hospital. They even built a Jewish cemetery. And so you had this steady stream, it was almost like a Jewish company town. And so you had a steady stream of um, young Jews um, who were leaving Baghdad, seeking their fortune with the Sassoons. And, and one, of the, one of the boys who goes um, is Eli Kaduri, um, whose family was distantly related to the Sassoons. The family had fallen on hard times and the, their mother wanted them to kind of get some money to, to send back. But just imagine what it must have been like for an 18 year, he was actually only 15 when he left Baghdad, 15 years old, goes to Bombay, apprentices with the Sassoons at 18 years old, is in Hong Kong, then in Shanghai, then in these small seaports in China, doesn't speak a word of Chinese, and is, you know, building a business and, and trying to deal with bubonic plague and, and, and all these challenges. It, it was really an extraordinary entrepreneurial spirit. Um, that 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 drove these uh, that drove both these families. And, and you and you write about a, a rivalry as as well between them. I mean, the first story of uh, the disinfectant, the disinfectant and the bubonic plague, uh, and then you know just a follow up. Uh, you know, Ellie, maybe some different values. He doesn't end up marrying someone from Baghdad. So there's yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it was interesting. The Sassoons were clearly the most prominent family. And I think Ellie Kaduri was, um, you know, he, he always felt that he was looked down upon because he started much poorer and then worked his way up. And ultimately, the Kaduri family is today the richest Western family in China. They're still there. They're worth more than $13 billion. But throughout the, the, the decades, there was always this sense of, of them not being recognized and acknowledged the way the Sassoons were. But Ellie, uh, Ellie Kaduri was in some ways very forward thinking. He actually makes his first million uh, before he's 30 in Shanghai and then does what young men do at that point, uh, young British men do, is he goes to London to find a wife. He doesn't go back to Baghdad. And in London, he, he meets a woman, Laura Makata, who's from a fairly prominent British Jewish family. And they get married. And typically what would have happened is that Ellie would have gone back to Shanghai, made his money, you know, visited his wife and children in London as they kind of lived a more settled and glamorous life. But Laura Kaduri was a really interesting woman, very ahead of her time. And she said, you're not leaving me back here in London. I'm going with you to Shanghai. And so she gets on the, the ship with him. They return to Hong Kong and then on to Shanghai. And in an even more extraordinary way, she keeps a diary for the next 15 years. And you can follow her. It's almost like reading about Catherine Hepburn in The African Queen, where she's sailing these ships through China, going with her husband, um, seeing you know Civil War battles break out, seeing the incredible poverty. And she also becomes, in many ways, the conscience of the family. Her husband is very focused on making money, and he's very good at it. But she looks around at this poverty and actually begins to feel that that the Kaduris have to do something for the Chinese uh, girls, especially. And so she creates a number of schools for Chinese girls in China, also in, in Baghdad. And again, this is like in 1905, 1910. I mean, nothing like this is going on, but you kind of see her spirit. Um, and it, it, it is something I think even the Chinese notice is very unusual for a Western family, a, a British woman to be, mm -hmm. to be doing this. Um, tragically, she actually um, is living in Shanghai um, with her family, with her young family, and a fire breaks out in the mansion that they're living in. And um, everyone gets out. Um, but Laura Kaduri is convinced that the governess who's been taking care of their children, the Chinese governess, is still trapped inside the mansion. So she runs back inside to save her. Uh, it turns out the Chinese governess had gotten out through another door. And Laura gets lost in the smoke and confused, and she dies in this fire. And the Chinese talk about this to this day. Um, it's probably a story your, your cab driver may have known, which was that the idea that a British woman, a, a rich woman, a rich Westerner would try, would go into a fire to save a Chinese servant is just unimaginable uh, to the Chinese. And it's something that I think shows the way in which this connection between um, Jews and the Jewish history in Shanghai and Chinese at a very human level, they had this kind of connection. And, 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 and the Chinese still talk about that um, while they're talking about kind of capitalist exploitation and the terrible things that many Westerners did in China. The Kaduris and the Sassoon sometimes stand out for being, you know, different than, than many, other, many other families. Well, and the, and the Kaduris in particular, I mean, vacationing in Japan as well, and, and Japan played a significant role in Shanghai that, that you may want to tell us about. But we, we have a question here, and I want to remind everyone, um, you're welcome to, to text questions in. You can place them onto the YouTube chat, and uh, we'll be able to see them here in real time. But David, um, David wants to know if you can talk a little bit more about the relationships with the Hardoons, the Hardoons, the Kaduris, and the Sassoon. Right. Yeah, there were there were three there were three great Jewish families in Shanghai. Um, I write about two of them because in the end they're the most important in understanding how China develops. Because one of the things we have to understand is that you know these these were not families that were running small little shops. Um, the Sassoons were owned a tremendous amount of real estate uh, in Shanghai. Um, they owned the brewery. They helped build the tram system. Um, the Kaduris also owned an incredible amount of real estate, numbers of factories. And then in Hong Kong, they were very influential. And they were a way in which the Chinese began to learn about the world. So Chinese businessmen um, in the 1920s, 1930s, 
would come in contact with the Kadoris and the Sassoons, work with them, learn about globalization, learn about trade. Um, very often people, I met some of them, they're in their 90s now, um, their parents would bring them to the Sassoon Hotel, the, the Peace Hotel, the Cafe Hotel, for dances where they would learn the Western dances. So these were families that really stood astride kind of the social life um, of Shanghai as, as well as business. Now the Hardoons were a third family, a very interesting family. They um, Hardoon had worked for the Sassoons, broke off, and kind of formed a business and then romantic alliance with a uh, half Chinese woman, a Eurasian woman, uh, who acted as his translator. They got married, um, and then she was very useful in developing contacts with the Chinese, and Hardoon became probably the wealthiest man in Shanghai. But what's interesting is, the, you know, people say to me, well, what's the book about? And, and really at heart, it's a family story and a family saga. And what you see is the way different families deal with things differently. And so the Sassoons, as I said, had these eight sons and they became kind of the, the real um, representatives of the business dynasty and worked very closely together until their father died when they all split apart. The Kaduris, in a similar way, um, Eli Kaduri relied on his two sons to run everything and kept them close, wouldn't let them become independent, really wanted them to kind of work for the family. The Hardoons uh, never had uh, biological children. They adopted 12 children. Half of them they raised as Jews, half of them they raised as Buddhists. And then as kind of a sign of what sometimes happens in all families, once uh, Hardoon died with this immense fortune, the family just started spinning apart and they all started suing each other and uh, the lawsuits went on for decades. And in fact, this huge fortune that they had um, amassed was essentially whittled away in all these lawsuits. So the Hardoons are kind of an interesting family and you can still see their legacy in Shanghai, um, but their impact was diluted because the family was never able to hold enough together to really influence history or, or, or what happened afterwards. Coming back um, uh, to the Kaduris, you know, one of the, the interesting features and to bring it into the present day um, in light of everything happening in Hong Kong, uh, Ellie's sons, uh, Lawrence and Horace, uh, both get involved in very different spheres in Hong Kong following the war, but, but they're still communicating daily every single day. And, and, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to hear about this and the history of philanthropy and the values that maybe Laura brought to them, uh, Horace, especially the micro loans is, is right. that. Somebody right. was, yeah, no, so it's, it's interesting. So Eli Kaduri, the patriarch was a very tough father. Um, I think, um, I, you know, I got to know him pretty well in, in terms of seeing all the papers and, and getting to know him. And, you know, the, the Japanese, uh, I just have to go back a little bit. So the Japanese, around the time your grandfather arrives in Shanghai, the Japanese are encircling Shanghai and they're coming in closer and closer. And um, the Jews are protected there in part because the Sassoons and the Kaduris work closely with the Japanese to protect these Jews. Uh, the Sassoons get out in time. But the Kaduris don't. The Kaduris are actually uh, captured by the Japanese in Hong Kong, and they're imprisoned uh, in Shanghai and in Hong Kong. And Eli Kaduri, the patriarch who had left Baghdad and started this dynasty, dies actually in the servants' quarters of his mansion in Shanghai. His children are in their 40s at this point. And um, the communists then come in, the family flees to Hong Kong, and his children for the first time are able to kind of decide, well, what do we do now? Our father is dead. We've left Shanghai. We're in Hong Kong. It's the late 1940s. What do we do? And they decide that their father had made a mistake, that as brilliant a businessman as he was, he had lived in a bubble. None of them had seen the Japanese were going to um, bomb Pearl Harbor and then conquer Shanghai. None of them had seen that the communists were going to take over Shanghai and drive them out. And they lost, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And so the two boys, they're men, they're in their 40s, decide that um, they're not going to live in isolation anymore. And so while they pursue their business and rebuild their fortune, and, and as I say, today are worth $13 billion, they also become very committed to philanthropy and especially helping Chinese refugees. 
Um, I think the experience of helping the Jewish refugees really shaped them. Horace, especially in, in Shanghai, never really liked business very much. But when the Jewish refugees like your grandfather started arriving, he sort of found his calling. He set up a school to educate uh, these refugees who were showing up. He gave a tremendous amount of money. He hired teachers. His brother, in fact, would write to him from Hong Kong saying, you've got to pay attention to the business. You're spending too much time with these refugees. But when they settle in Hong Kong, Horace decides, you know, he's really not going to do much for the business. And he begins to set up these programs to help Chinese refugees who are coming from Red China into, into Hong Kong. And um, he decides to set up almost small plots um, rather than just giving charity. He says, you know, we will help fund small agricultural plots where the Chinese refugees can do some farming. They can sell their products. He gives them small loans, these micro loans, so they can buy things. And the Kaduris also fund research on pigs. Um, you know, pork is a staple of the Chinese diet. Everyone eats pork in China. Hong Kong's population is increasing because all these refugees are pouring in. So the Kaduris fund all this research on how to get bigger pigs and fatter pigs. And the Chinese develop this joke, which they tell even today, where they say, oh, the Kaduris know everything about pigs except what they taste like because they, they're, keep, <laughs> they're keeping kosher. Um, so I, I think that what you see is kind of the their mother's concern about China and her feeling that the Kuduris had to give something back to this country that was giving them so much in Hong Kong as well. I think what's difficult for the family now is they're extremely powerful in Hong Kong. They meet regularly with the Chinese leadership. They meet with the president of China. And now as Hong Kong is changing again, and as the Chinese are cracking down, as we all know, I think the Kaduris are nervous that is this Shanghai all over again? Are we going to be once again having to pack up and flee? Um, and, and no one really knows what, what has happened. But I think that, you know, they're a family that is trying to walk this tightrope between being very successful in a business sense, but also morally having some kind of a conscience about what's happening to, to all the Chinese who live there. Hmm. Yes, complicated issues in, indeed. Um, and I guess the, the jury's still out on where it will take us. Um, no, nevertheless, we're, we're, um, we're going to jump back into some of the past uh, with the opium trade and um, uh, nothing like trying to build a dynasty out of opium um, uh, relating to the Jardines originally where they were transporting. And then at, at a point, um, I guess, it's is it after the, the Second Opium War, uh, the Sassoons overtake the Jardines, they're, they're Gentile competitors. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a fascinating story, and it's really a fascinating kind of buccaneer business story. Um, the Sassoons were um, incredibly good and innovative businessmen. Uh, so the the uh, as you say, the the opium trade was started by the British. And the reason why Britain went to war against China in the 1840s was to open up China to the opium trade. And the Sassoons, because there was a lot of money to be made, begin to dabble in the opium trade. But once the, the, these wars open up China, the Sassoons realize that technologically there are a lot of advantages that they can bring to this. So they begin to invest in steamships, right? Most ships that are bringing the opium from India where it's grown to China where it's sold are sailing ships. So the Sassoons invest in steamships, which actually get the opium there a lot faster. They're also one of the earliest investors in the telegraph. Um, which allows uh, the sons who are in Shanghai to telegraph um, the, the, the family back in Bombay about when to ship the opium. Um, and so these are all ways in which sort of technologically um, the Sassoons are able to leap ahead of their competitors. And within 20 or 30 years, when you look at the Jardines business records, they're all writing to each other saying, who are these upstarts? Who are these Jews? Who are these people who are taking away all our business? And by 1870 or so, the Sassoons have become the dominant, um, the dominant traders of opium uh, in China. And it's incredibly, um, it's incredibly profitable. Now, when I speak to the Sassoon family now, you know, their approach is basically, well, you know, opium was legal. And like cigarettes or like alcohol, it was a vice. And we were kind of providing, you know, we were selling, selling this. 
and, and they try to, to treat it the way we now talk about cigarettes or alcohol. But the fact is, and, and there's an element of truth to that. Opium was legal. Um, aspirin really wasn't in wide use in Europe um, at this point. And, and so people would take opium for headaches and the Sassoons would get the King of England and the Prince of Wales to invest in, in, in opium and to do trades in opium. So it, it was legal in that sense. But the Sassoons knew how bad opium was. I mean, just to give you a sense, about 12% of uh, the Chinese population was addicted to opium at this time. About 2% of Americans have an opioid problem, the opioid crisis that we talk about. And we see the kind of destruction and pain that it's caused to American families. Imagine something six times as worse. And that's kind of what China was, was facing. And the Sassoons themselves never used opium. Um, and they, in their writings, they often had to dismiss Chinese employees who were addicted to opium. So they knew how bad it was. And there was a real movement in Britain and elsewhere to uh, abolish opium and to stop the opium trade, which the Sassoons fought all the time. So I, I think in the end, you know, we have to pass some judgment on this. And, and it, it clearly was, um, uh, it, it hurt the Chinese very much. Um, but, you know, as somebody once said, behind every great fortune, there's a crime. And in the case of the Sassoons, the crime, you know, the crime was opium. Um, I would argue that part of the complexity of the Sassoons is that many of the things that they did subsequent to that, and even at the time, opened up China, benefited China. Clearly, they, they helped uh, many of the refugees, the Jewish refugees who came. But it's not a simple black or white story. It's it's complex. And, um, and even members of the Sassoon's own family um, were very um, critical of, of many of the things the family did. So it's, as I say, you know, when you write about Jewish history, there's this impulse we all have to say, oh, well, the Jews are always heroes. And you know, we're always victims. And well, in fact, these were Jews with an immense amount of power and they acted like businessmen, you know, very much like their British and American contemporaries. And and that that sort of stereotyping and um, feelings of elitism, I think, is, is present um, uh, in, in a way that's really interesting reading back into these narratives. You know, when traveling in China myself, uh, there, there is still a certain, you know, arm's length treatment of any foreigners, and um, and I'm sure you're aware of an experience that as well. But you know, this went that direction also from these Jewish families that um, uh, non-Jews as well, I should say. But the, the Chinese were like not on the same level as them always. How how did they deal with that morally and ethically? Well, because I think in the end, the Kaduris and the Sassoons saw themselves as British imperialists and and colonialists. I mean, they were part of the, the West colonizing China, opening China up to trade, exploiting Chinese labor, all those things, all those things were true. Now, I would argue, you know, they were probably more liberal than many pretty British businessmen. Um, Victor Sassoon, for example, was one of the first people to allow Chinese to, to come to his hotel, to go there. And the Kaduri certainly employed many Chinese. But I mean, in a sense, it's striking to me, these two families in China for now almost 200 years, uh, no one in any of the family ever bothered to learn Chinese because they dealt with the Chinese at a distance. They had, you know, servants and, and so forth. So they didn't really need to learn. They didn't need to learn Chinese. Um, but I do think part of what's so remarkable, though, about the refugee story that your grandfather was part of was that at a human level, it turned out things were a little different. So the Sassoons and the Kaduris were way up there. They were extremely prominent and went to the social clubs and, and lived this kind of colonial life. But when the Shanghai refugees begin to show up, and as you say, there were 18,000 of them, many of them were literally fleeing for their lives and had been chased out of their communities by their neighbors who had turned against them, who were humiliating them, were seizing their homes. They land in Shanghai, a place they knew nothing about. They don't speak any Chinese. And yet over and over again, when I spoke to the Shanghai refugees, when I spoke to the um, and read their memoirs, what they're so struck by is how nice the Chinese were to them. 
These were ordinary Chinese who were also desperately poor. They too were being kind of oppressed by the Japanese who were gradually conquering China. And yet over and over again, you hear Jewish refugees saying how the Chinese would share their food with them. They would give their kids rickshaw rides. They would be nice to them. And so at a human level, I think there was a way in which the, the Second World War threw the Chinese and the Jews together and there was kind of a common bond there and a warmth that I think you still see today. I, you know, China is one of those places where when you go there and say you're Jewish, you're not going to run into that kind of, you know, whether it's anti-Zionism or anti-Semitism that we sometimes feel increasingly in other parts of the world. The Chinese are really fascinated by the Jews and um, they have a certain admiration for Jews. And I think they know they have this history as your cab driver said, that they really helped Jews at a time when Jews needed help. And, um, and I think that's something that's, you know, very heartening in this, in this day and age. And it, and it goes the same way from, from that dismissiveness that was originally part of, of perhaps the, the Jews' views of the communists or of the nationalists or, or whatnot into, um, into a perspective that, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if I detected this correctly, um, I'm, I'm dying to ask you, you know, Lawrence, who it, at one point um, is asked for a reaction as, as China is starting to encroach on Hong Kong more and says, um, you know, democracy in this area of the world, maybe, maybe this isn't a place of emphasis for us. There's other ways to get done what we need. I'm paraphrasing his words. Yeah, no, no. So, I mean, Lawrence Kaduri, who is the, the most powerful son in the Kaduri family, um, and, you know, I, I think he's walking a political tightrope. Um, you know, Hong Kong, from the very start, has China looming over it. And what's interesting is after the communists take over China um, for the next 40 or 50 years, while Hong Kong booms and, and China kind of doesn't, um, the Kaduris never say a bad word about China. They never criticize it publicly because they believe at some point China will open up again and they'll be able to do business with it. And so in 1978, when China does open up, um, one of the first calls that the Chinese make is to Lawrence Kaduri, inviting him back. And the Kaduris become very big investors uh, in China um, and, um, and, and do a lot of business there. Um, and so I, I think that, that Lawrence Kaduri, he's a conservative guy anyway, but he also recognizes that in the end, the communists will decide what's going to happen. And I think what's interesting about his dilemma is that it's something every businessman is dealing with in China now, whether you're at Google or Zoom or, you know, any company dealing with China is trying to figure out how do we deal with uh, a country like China, but also sleep at night. And, and, and make sure we're not contributing to oppression or surveillance and so forth. And one thing that's interesting to me is that my book is being uh, translated into Chinese and is going to be published in China, um, which couldn't happen without the government's approval, obviously. And I, I take that as a good sign in that the Chinese do want to understand the complexity of history and do want to understand how you can be a capitalist, but also maybe do some good things. Or you can be a Westerner, but also be Jewish and maybe your history is different. Um, but I, I, I think that one thing the Kaduris have shown is that you very often have to navigate this very narrow bridge between what your morals and your Jewish values may teach you and what business may require of you. And I think that's something which, you know, I, I think for me made the book very relevant because we all face these moral choices, right? We don't choose our moment. And sometimes we find our values as Jews or as ordinary people conflicting with maybe what business may require of us. And I think the Sassoons and the Kaduris face this all the time in China and Hong Kong. So, so Jonathan, um, we have a, a question in our chat as well. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, just for those who haven't had the, um, the pleasure of reading the book yet, uh, maybe you can fill in the gap about how one runs a successful business in China. And what do you do when suddenly you've lobbied and extended and opium's legal for a while, but suddenly it's not? You got to diversify, right? Is that the secret? Right. And that's what the um, that's what the Kaduris and the Sassoons did. They had made all their money in opium, but then they started buying up real estate 
and going into other areas. Um, and the thing is, you know, Shanghai, you know, for anyone who's ever been to China or read about it, I mean, Shanghai is very different than the rest of China. The, the, the Bund, which was this, the waterfront there, has all these beautiful Art Deco buildings. I mean, it's a very Western looking city. And a lot of that is because of the Sassoons and the Kaduris. Uh, Shanghai is essentially carved up by different um, colonial powers, including the US and Great Britain, uh, Germany, Japan, the French. Um, and so it has a very different feel about it. And so the Kaduris and the, Ch and the Sassoons early on realize that, you know, building power plants, for example, bringing electricity to Shanghai and to Hong Kong is a way to make money. Um, building factories is a way to make money. Um, setting up banks is a way to make money. So a lot of the money that the Sassoons originally make in opium goes into these other um, avenues. The problem is that when you buy a lot of real estate, you can't move it. And so the Sassoons um, before World War II were probably the fifth or sixth wealthiest family in the world because of all the property they own in Shanghai and all their investments. When the communists take over, of course, they seize everything. And the Sassoons flee China and they never go back. And they're not poor, but you know they're having an auction actually in two weeks at uh, Sotheby's selling off a lot of their artwork because the family kind of needs the cash. Um, the Kaduris, in a way, are better businessmen in that they sense things are going to change early on, and they begin to move their money to Hong Kong, and they feel it's safer because it's a British colony and so forth. But even then, um, it's interesting, the Kaduris, as I said, had helped these refugees, had built a school to help the Jewish refugees who had arrived in Shanghai. When all these refugees leave, they leave through Hong Kong, and the Kaduris put them up. Uh, at their hotel. They have this beautiful hotel, the Peninsula Hotel, um, and they put up bunk beds in the ballrooms and they're housing all these refugees. And Lawrence Kaduri goes around to each of them and starts giving them brown paper envelopes stuffed with cash. And he says to them, when you settle in Australia, could you buy up some property in my name and start some investments there? When you go to the States or wherever, they want to get their money out so they're not going to be caught again. And that's really the start of their kind of globalized fortune. So, you know, what's that famous phrase? You want to think Yiddish, but dress British. And I, I think the Sassoons and the Kaduris both uh, both uh, tried to do that. I think I think we're going to have to save it for another conversation. But I, I was the rabbi in Auckland, New Zealand for three years and got to travel around Asia. And I, I think even today, Hong Kong is the wealthiest Jewish community in the whole world. They um, they were very forward thinking and, and built a, um, a skyscraper that they generate rent from regularly. Um, and uh, I, I guess, you know, before we go also, uh, Victor Sassoon. Um, what a character. Can, can, you share, can you share who he is and how he went from his beginnings uh, as a, a second grade student at Oxford to becoming the uh, patriarch of the family, I guess, at least the business empire end of it? Sure. No, Victor Sassoon, if a movie is ever made of this book, he'll be the star. So, Victor, so the Sassoon family, as they became wealthier, the um, the sons and the grandsons became less and less interested in the business. Um, they mostly wanted to go to London and, and live a high life and hobnob with royalty. Um, and the women in the family weren't given uh, many opportunities, although some of them were extraordinarily talented. And I, I talk about them a lot in the book. Victor Sassoon was, as you say, he was a, he was a party guy. Um, he was at Cambridge, always seen with a chorus girl on, on each arm. And everyone always assumed, well, he'll just be one of those Sassoons who spends money and, and never makes it. Um, during World War I, he's in a flying accident and he's crippled. He loses the use of his legs. And he decides at that point that, you know, he'll never live the high life in Europe. He's, he's kind of very humiliated by his injuries. And so he decides he'll go to India and Shanghai and just kind of run the business. And he turns out to be an extraordinarily brilliant businessman. And he makes a decision to bring all the family fortune to Shanghai and to build uh, this hotel and to, to do all his investments. Um, and, um, and he has this kind of lust for life um, and a lot of lust as well. So when I went to the Cafe Hotel, you can go there now, it's called the Peace Hotel. And Victor Sassoon builds this hotel. Um, he brings in chefs from Europe and hotel managers and Charlie Chaplin and all this. And he builds a suite for himself at the very top of the hotel overlooking Shanghai. 
and I got to see it. I went there to visit and I, they, they took me up there. And uh, I went into the bathroom, which was beautiful. It had a marble floor and beautiful fixtures. And there were two bathtubs in Victor Sassoon's bathroom. And so I said to the Chinese uh, fellow who was taking me around, I said, why are there two bathtubs here? And he looks at me and he says, well, Sir Victor always said he didn't mind sharing his bed, but he didn't like sharing his bath. And that gives you a sense of the kind of what Victor Sassoon was like. He had a string of affairs um, while he was there, including with a writer for The New Yorker. Um, at one point I was doing research. Emily Hahn. Yeah. Emily Hahn. I was doing research in... Um, in the library where his diaries were, which for bizarre reasons ended up in Texas. And I'm in this beautiful library going through these diaries of 1920s, 1930s Shanghai and out slip all these photographs of naked women. And I'm a little kind of concerned that the librarian's gonna come over and throw me out. Well, it turned out that Victor Sassoon, one of the ways he met women was he was an amateur photographer. And if you were beautiful and got off the boat in Shanghai in 1920 or 1930s with Charlie Chaplin and all the rest, he would say, come to my studio and I'll photograph you. And he would keep the photographs. So um, what's really though important about him, I think in many ways is that when the Jewish refugees start showing up, he realizes this is a crisis. And in fact, Eli Kaduri, his Jewish rival, comes to him and says in his hotel suite, Victor, you're a playboy, you're living this life, but this is a crucial moment for our people and you need to step up. And Victor Sassoon, to his credit, does. And he begins to um, uh, turn over a lot of his buildings. He turns them into um, uh, uh, dormitories where, where, where Jewish refugees can stay. He employs many of the Jewish refugees. Um, he gives them money so they can buy food and milk and, and so forth. But most importantly, he begins this kind of con job with the Japanese. The Japanese put a, a anti-Semitic Japanese colonel um, uh, Colonel Inazuka in charge of Shanghai's Jewish problem, right? They've got all these Jewish refugees showing up. They're allied with the Nazis. The Nazis are saying, what are you doing protecting all these Jews? And so Victor Sassoon kind of turns on this charm offensive. And the Japanese believe already that Jews kind of control the world and the world economy. And they think Victor Sassoon is really important. And so Victor basically says to them, I'll talk to Churchill. I'll talk to my friends in America. We'll keep them out of the war. Keep the Jews here. You know, you don't want to harm them. At the same time, he's spying on them. He's having his bartenders report on what they're doing. He secretly flies to South America to try to buy land where these Jews might be able to be resettled. Eventually, the Japanese catch on to him and he has to flee Shanghai. But as a result of his efforts and also of the Kaduris, none of these refugees are killed during their time. Even when the Nazis send um, people who had uh, uh, destroyed the ghetto in Poland, they send members of the Gestapo to Shanghai and say to the Japanese, look, you've got all these Jews here, round them up, put them on barges, sink the barges in the river, that'll take care of your Jewish problem. Victor Sassoon has been so effective that persuading the Japanese that the Jews are, are valuable almost as hostages um, and that he'll kind of negotiate with the Americans and the British that these Jews are protected. So um, so I think that's a way in which, you know, this was his great moment, uh, his great moral moment, and I think he rose to it. What's so striking to me is he never acknowledges it afterwards. He never talks about it. Um, I met people who knew him when he was an old man. And, you know, his Jewish background wasn't very important to him. He always minimized it. He always made fun of it. And yet here was a moment where he really should be kind of lionized for this. Um, but a little bit like Schindler, you know, he, he had this moment and, and, then, and then it passed. Um, so again, he's, he's kind of a puzzle. But I think in the end, you know, um, I, he just was an extraordinary figure. And uh, if I could have gone to one party in Shanghai, it, it would have been to one of Victor Sassoon's parties. Wait, the one, the one where he was the ringmaster or the one where he... <laughs> um, uh, I'll, I'll save you from one of these questions. Vidal Sassoon is not part of the family, unfortunately. That would be a great story too, wouldn't it? Right, yeah, but no, it's not a different part of the family. Um, tell us about these these families' relationships with with Israel, Palestine uh, in the early period. There there was some interplay there and some disappointment. Yeah. And well, some important. I mean, it was interesting. So um, 
part of the reason why Chinese and Jews have this connection is that Eli Kaduri, the patriarch of the Kaduri family, uh, was actually a, quite an avid Zionist. The Sassoons were not. They were much more concerned with being British. They didn't really, while they the early early on they were quite religious, they move away from religion, uh, most of them, when they go to England and when they go to China. But the Kaduris are different. They're quite avid Zionists. And when the Balfour Declaration uh, is issued, um, Eli Kaduri, who's in charge of Zionism in Asia, goes to Sun Yat-sen, who is sort of the George Washington of China. And he goes to him and says, will you endorse the Balfour Declaration? And Sun Yat-sen writes, writes this extraordinary letter to Eli Kaduri where he says, you know, my people are being colonized. We've lost our homeland because you British and Americans are here. We recognize that the Jews have also lost their homeland. And this is something that unites us. And so from a very early stage, you see this connection between um, Israel, what will become Israel, and China, um, and, the, and the Jews. Um, now, Eli Kaduri does give a lot of money to the Zionist cause. Um, as a businessman, he wants things done his way, so there are some disputes along the way and so forth. But, but in the end, you know, I think the Kaduris always, Zionism was important because the Kaduris felt more vulnerable. You know, they had fled Baghdad. They had to flee Shanghai. Now they're in Hong Kong. I think the idea of having a, a homeland was important to them. The Sassoons, not so much. They were so accepted into British society. They became ministers in the British government. Um, you know, for them, I think they may have kind of a, a personal affection for Israel, but they were never Zionists in the way the, the, the Kaduris were. Hmm. A, a question here from Sylvia H. Paz. Um, how Jewish are these families now and their descendants? Well, I say, you know, one of the reasons I like writing about these families is that, you know, they're a lot like us. Um, you know, I, I think you could see uh, certainly the Kaduris, but even the Sassoons could show up at any of our synagogues or at this talk or at, at a Jewish book fair. Um, the Sassoons have pretty much drifted away from Judaism, the kind of rich end of the family. Another part of the family um, actually became quite scholarly and produced a number of rabbis and several live in Jerusalem. So the family kind of split along those lines. The Kaduris are much more, they're sort of like Michael Bloomberg. <clears throat> or, or Jews who are working on Wall Street. Um, their Jewish identity is important. They go to services for the high holidays. They support the synagogue. But their fame and their influence is really tied to their activities the other five or six days a week. Um, and so in that way, I think it's interesting because here you're seeing Jewish families that were very powerful, not just in the Jewish sphere and not just because they were Jewish, um, but how did their values kind of, and their history shape those decisions. So if you talk about the Kaduris or the Sassoons to most people, it's their business activities and their wealth and, and their, their involvement in, in China that people will talk about. Um, I think their Chinese values shape that. Um, but in that way, they're very much like most of us today um, who are part of society, live our lives, have our jobs, see our kids succeed. And our Jewish values are something that you know, inform that somehow. Well, I mean, it's something that brings it back to Professor Lupovich's comments right at the start are the ways that um, Jews throughout history, thinking of the golden age of Spain, have kind of been able to uh, cross through boundaries in ways that that others haven't and there's other communities they can connect with and other people and um uh it, this is this is just a, a fascinating fascinating story and uh thank you so much for sharing it with us jonathan really appreciate it thanks so much i really enjoyed it. okay well thank you jonathan rabbi for being with us and for such an amazing and informative event and thank you to all of you at home for joining us our next event is saturday at 7 p.m after shabbat when we welcome tova felshu to discuss her memoir lilyville mother daughter and other roles i played remember to like this video subscribe to your YouTube channel, and visit our website, culturalarts.jccdet.org slash book fair for a full schedule and ways to get involved and buy Mr. Kaufman's book. Have a lovely Shabbat. Thank you.